Hello and welcome everyone to Positive Luxury's Future of Beauty and Fragrance webinar. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to join us. This webinar forms part of Positive Luxury's Knowledge Program, which supports our mission to shape a sustainable future for the luxury industry. Our butterfly mark assessment and services help truly embed sustainability in luxury organisations, helping to future-proof businesses and drive real value and in return on sustainability investment. We want this webinar and our future beauty and fragrance report published earlier today to inspire and help you on your sustainability journey. Now the beauty and fragrance category is undergoing a period of extraordinary transformation at the moment, from leaps forward in green chemistry and biomimicry to a shift towards inclusive beauty, every aspect of the industry is being re-examined. Our latest report, we approach this complex transformation through a lens of sustainability by setting out the key themes we believe will define the future of the industry offering tangible case studies and key actions to take. I do encourage you all to download it from positiveluxury.com. To explore these themes and issues today, I'm delighted to say how lucky and honored we are to have such an amazing panel. To do justice and give them all a proper introduction would take too long, but please welcome joining us today, Sabrina Elba, as well as being a UN Goodwill Ambassador, Conservation International Board member, modeling, acting and presenting, is also co-founder of skincare brand and wellness initiative, Sable Labs, who are currently undergoing Butterfly Mark certification with Positive Luxury. Rhea Cartwright, a strategic consultant, journalist and beauty specialist who has spent over a decade working with global beauty and lifestyle brands and who has a passion for economic empowerment and is the founder of the Stack World, a leading tech-based women's community platform. And Mathieu Flamini, who isn't here just because I'm a huge Arsenal fan, but because he's possibly had the most interesting post-professional football career as an environmental entrepreneur and now as co-founder and CEO of GF Biochemicals, a bio-based chemical experts finding sustainable alternatives to petroleum-based products. Some quick housekeeping before we begin. This webinar will last about 45 minutes in total. There'll be 30 minutes of panel discussion followed by 10 minutes of taking questions. So please, audience, do post your questions in the Q&A tab in your browser, and we'll do our very best to answer them. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to our host today, Positive Luxury co-founder, Diana Verdinetto. Diana, over to you. Thank you very much, Jamie, and welcome, everybody. It's a real honor uh, to be here with you all and to really kind of deep dive into the world of beauty and fragrances. Um, Ria, I'd like to start with you because you are a journalist and you have been uh, kind of working in this industry for quite a long time. So I'd like to ask you, um, can you tell us what changes have you witnessed post-COVID, especially in the beauty industry from a consumer standpoint? Yeah, of course. I think as well, it's, it's worth noting that actually my career started off working with businesses and founders. So I always say to people that I have a really kind of interesting perspective because quite often you have journalists that go into consulting, whereas I was working directly with businesses and consulting and then became a journalist. So that's given me the lens through a consumer's eye because I work for a considerable amount of time on the shop floor and in leading retailers in London. I think post COVID, ultimately we're looking for connection and community across everything. And that also extends to beauty. And I think the word community is thrown about far too often. I think often social media platforms suggest that they are creating a community, but actually it's a very B to C relationship, right? Brand posts. And then the like the people that are following just comment. I think what we're seeing a lot now with community is how does how do the brand lovers and the advocates communicate with each other? And also how are brands creating their own ways of content to communicate with their communities? And I think that's what people are looking for. I think especially for D to C brands, where obviously their distribution is much harder they're almost having to create, you know, mini media companies within their brands to have those multiple different touch points. Because if you're not going into a, whether it's a luxury department store or a high street pharmacy to get your beauty and your personal care products, the connection with the product is much harder. Um, I think additionally, you know, during uh, 2020 especially and various kind of, you know, systemic issues that came to the forefront, particularly around, I think we have lost temporarily, Ria. So, okay, 
let's this is actually a really good set way to talk about you know you sabrina because community and coupledom is is part of the same thing really so you know as a founder of sabbath lab um a brand that stands from the principles of coupledom which is about creating strong partnerships within business with one another and in the case of sabbath lab is actually with nature and society so can you tell us a little bit more about what inspires you to start Sabo's Lab and also what drives, uh, what's the drive behind uh, Capeldom? Yeah, I mean, where do I start? It was, it's been a long journey for us and it really was, um, so myself and my husband Idris kind of at the beginning of lockdown when we were feeling really isolated from everyone we love and, you know, rightfully so, like the rest of the world, we, it was hard to keep in touch. We started thinking that well-being, our own personal well-being, would have to include other people. It has to include the relationships in our life. So much of self-care is so selfish. It's all about what what can I do for me, and, and how do I make myself feel better? And then, granted, that's obviously very important. But I didn't want to forget, and we didn't want to forget that the relationships in our life make up so much of our happiness and our peace of mind. So. Uh, we started thinking about what that meant in our own working relationship and how we uh, take to nurture that. And and we started actually this tiny little Instagram live series at the height of lockdown so that we could speak to other duos and ask them how they were doing it. Just learning about what it takes to maintain a healthy relationship. The idea grew so much faster than we thought it would. The community grew so much faster than we thought it would. And we realized there's so many different types of partnerships and relationships that we wanted to include. So not only are you talking about the relationship with the people around you, but you're also talking about the relationship you have with yourself. And we decided that would be one of the most important parts of coupledom. Apart from that, we didn't want to do it in a way that felt like it didn't include the outside world. So we realized very quickly that the planet would have to also be another integral partnership that was sort of like a keystone of the brand. We didn't even know it was a brand back then, to be fair. So we have this idea of coupledom floating around. We understand it has so much to do with our relationships, ourselves, and our planet, and we think how best to, to you know speak to the community. Where do we go from here? And that's when we really wanted to do Sable Labs. And Sable is elbows backwards. It's like people are always like, is it Sabla or is it something? You know, it really just is our, our surnames um, inverted. But it wanted we wanted it to encompass all our values, and we looked at it as a way to really cultivate that relationship with you have with yourself because. We're both of the spirit where we take five to 10 minutes in the morning or however long we have, and we have our own routine. And in that routine, we're feeling good. And out of that, we're doing good. So we're we're presenting ourselves to the best we can to the people around us. And it, it helps sort of full circle on the full belief of coupledom. And if you're taking care of yourself, you're taking care of people around you. So that's kind of how it started. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it's so inspiring because a lot of stuff, I mean, sometimes people think that beauty is just skin deep, but actually it's not. It's so much more than that. And it goes into mental health, which is a little bit of what you're talking about. And of course, the way that you look after yourself and the way you interact with others is so, so fundamentally important to actually create this health around everything, society, planet, and so on. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, and I'd like to, to go to you, Matt, because, I mean, what is uh, uh, inside the product is so important as well. And, um, you know, innovation, it's uh, heart to heart in the, in the, in, in, at the core of the beauty industry. So can you tell us a little bit more about biotech? Um, why is this becoming the center of new formulations and ingredients? And can you tell us a little bit more about the company that you have founded as well? Well, thanks a lot, Diana. Very pleased to be here. So <clears throat> the beauty and personal care industry is, it's, it's very interesting because, I mean, the way it's evolving is putting a huge pressure on all industrial and chemical sector, I will say, because the chemical industry is an industry which not everyone is very much aware of about what they are doing, but the chemical industry is basically like manufacturing most of the, 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 the consumer product we are using in our everyday life because <clears throat> a shampoo, a shower gel is made of a formulation. And those ingredients are today being made by large uh, industrial and, and large chemical companies. And this industry is under massive pressure. Why? Because on one side you have the regulator and especially EU, which is becoming more and more strict in terms of the product we are using. 
And on the other side, you also have the consumer, people like you, people like me, which are becoming more and more aware of uh, the products they are using and are putting more and more pressure on the big brand, okay, in order to accelerate this transition. And we have also the EU, which has uh, coming out, who came out with a report, which are targeting like, I think, 12,000 products, which are uh, going to be phased out from, from the market. So the, the personal and beauty industry is a very interesting because they are the one driving this innovation. And on our side and on the, on the GF Biochemical side, a company which I've co-founded and which I'm running now and been co-founded like 12 years ago, so quite some time ago, we have seen this evolution. And what we're trying to do is to very much like replace all these petrol-based ingredients, so coming from oil industry, which are unfortunately like could have some negative impact on the environment, but also on the health of people. And all those molecules, all those ingredients are slowly, slowly being phased out and being pushed out from the market. But obviously what we need to do is to bring replacement. We, bring, we need to bring like solution. We need to bring like new molecules which are able to address the same work and deliver also the performance and at the same time being safer and more sustainable. And this is exactly what we do. We have developed a set of 200 patents in 40 different family and we are addressing uh, the, the, the sector of personal care. And what we're trying to do is to deliver a safer ingredient for people like you and me to use like a safer and more sustainable consumer goods. So we address like uh, products such as like the air care industry, such as like the, the deodorant industry, and we're replacing products such as like uh, silicone, or we're also trying to work with big FMCG company to come out with like safer uh, sunscreen in order to, to affect much less, I would say the corals and the sea. So we're trying to bring solution to a market which is like evolving very rapidly. Thank you very much. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting because the beauty industry is probably uh, one of the least ones in terms of transparency. And we have seen this and it's now that regulation is coming to the fore. Is this acceleration towards that? And, um, and it's really inspiring to see how incredible brands are stepping up to the plate. New brands like Sabu Labs are actually, you know, starting the business with these principles at the heart of it. But I'd like to go to you, Ria. I mean, in terms of what we just heard from Matthew, do you think that the clean beauty, uh, um, you know, needs more transparency? Do you think that clean beauty is a real thing? What, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I mean... I like to kind of use the phrase, you know, sex sells, but fear spreads, right? So there's nothing that the industry loves more than kind of marketing that makes people, I think, fearful, fearful around certain ingredients, fearful around things being toxic and that transparency. And I think ultimately, you know, the role of marketeers and journalists is, is to sell product. And I think what's been happening is that there has now, you know, thankfully been leading scientists and brands that are so ethical are actually saying, OK, look, there definitely are, um, there have been historically manufacturing processes that definitely are harmful for both, you know, both our bodies and definitely for the environment. Uh, but I think now it's it's a matter of how can we discuss and dissect the problems that definitely do exist in the clearest way because I think what's definitely happened um and, you know it happens in every industry but it definitely happens very prominently in beauty is that people latch on because they say oh it's another new trend you know when you look at you know beauty kind of from our ancestors it was all clean beauty because there was no choice so of course you know you would use products in their rawest form in their purest form so I think what we're seeing there's something about you know clean beauty and and I, I must admit even as myself I'm I'm quite uh, I'm on the fence about that term purely because the opposite of clean is dirty right and you know as um, Matt mentioned you know regulations and testing are, are increasingly more challenging so actually the idea of beauty, a dirty beauty kind of doesn't exist but at the same time when you look at you know certain products particularly let's say um, products for uh, black people particularly within hair for example have got a lot more chemicals that have been proven to accelerate certain health issues so discussions need to be had for sure i think you know again actually if we look at how consumers are navigating all all areas of their life post covid this idea of health and making sure that what we kind of ingest and use topically on our body is the safest form 
is definitely at the forefront of people's minds. And I think the idea that, you know, clean beauty equals natural is fantastic. Again, it's almost that nod to going back to simpler times when things are much easier. But, you know, to echo Matt again, it's then, well, actually, if we have, I don't know, avocado oil and then we use it in its pure form, how much water does it take to create, you know, one liter of avocado oil. So that's where then there have to be, um, and thank goodness, you know, you know, Matt's company and, and lots of other companies are doing it, are finding sustainable ways to mimic that structure. So, you know, as us as the consumer, we get the exact same result, but the, I guess, you know, the cost on the environment is, is far less. Thank you very much. And I mean, I'd like to, to see, uh, you know, to speak with you, Sabrina, because, you know, as a co-founder of Asavas Lab and uh, and your team, have everybody the same fire uh, for fantastic formulations, great processes, uh, a complete unison with uh, people and the environment. So can you tell us a little bit more? I know that you haven't launched yet, so this is why I am being careful with how I ask you this question. But could you tell us a little bit more about the DNA of Savos Lab and how did you do it? Um, you know, kind of your, your principles and some of the fantastic innovation that you guys are coming up with. And I, I leave that because I know you're launching soon. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, we are, which is so exciting. And thank you, because that's a compliment coming from an organization like Positive Luxury. We knew at the very start um, of this brand and, and as soon as we conceptualized even doing skincare, that it was going to be important for us to do it with the same ethics and values that we hold towards anything else that we do. So we very, very much cared about the integrity that went into the product. So working with organizations like Positive Luxury from the outset for us to be able to build the standard and rather than go backwards after the fact was so important. We didn't want to put, you know, anything out that we weren't proud of. There were certain um, benchmarks, I guess, that we challenged ourselves to meet. We do a lot of philanthropic work with rural people and rural communities in, in the means of um, supporting them with income and jobs through agriculture. So we never wanted to be able to put out a line that would source ingredients in a way that was irresponsible. So for us, it was so important to have the traceability and the transparency for ourselves. It, I mean, and I mean that selfishly for ourselves, we cared so much more. And then we thought, okay, you know what, this is also a benefit for the consumer. And this is something that I think the consumer should care about. We should be asking and demanding where ingredients for products come from. Because the supply chain gets so ignored when we're talking about, you know, people talk about packaging, which yes, we looked at that, of course, we use all PCR, we decided that would probably be best for us. And we looked at all of the, you know, other benchmarks that people look at, but we feel like people who I believe rural people are now the face of climate change really because they are the most affected should be part of the of the the problem here right they should be part of the solution as well because we do also believe agriculture supports bio, bio, biodiversity and it really is a great means to to help us in the climate change fight particularly when you're talking about people who know the ground better than anyone else they're the custodians of this planet they understand better than anyone how much water goes into planting an avocado right so uh, going by their measure and letting them lead and also dictating to us a little bit of what ingredients we should use um you know for instance uh, if if shea was something that we want to use we would be looking at how it affects the communities there that would then be a decision on our team's part to go, well, maybe we don't use that ingredient because it isn't having such a positive effect here. So that was something really at the heart um, of the products that we were building. But we also wanted to put out, and I know we don't like the word clean beauty, and Rhea, I, I, Rhea, I really agree with you because I don't know um, what dirty beauty is, but for us, it was clean in the sense that it was, if this, something doesn't need to be in it, it doesn't need to be in it. There's a way around it. And I think that's where innovation and technology is so important in this conversation. Because as much as it's easy to get lazy with particular ingredients, because they work, if they're having a negative effect, then let's use tech, let's use innovation. What can we upcycle out of other ingredients to have these same effects? So for us, clean really meant transparent. It meant pairing things back. It meant using old traditional ingredients. Um, one of the products I feel I can say now, um, uses qasal powder, which is a, a pro, uh, an ingredient out of Somalia that my mom used when I was a kid. I watched her clean her face with it every day and finding it, okay, well, great. Well, that's a great, um, you know, alternative than rather just putting a bunch of sulfates in a, in a cleanser and, you know, and, and also compromising a little bit because understanding that consumers are not expecting something that gets super foamy and is really rich and creamy or smells really great. I think, I think consumers are past that now. We want to know that 
we can make sacrifices a little bit here and there as long as we know there's a maximum effect on skin because there's a minimum impact on planet. Thank you very much. I mean, um, I, I I really kind of um, it resonates this this unison, this coupledom between the product, the people, and the communities because really goes into into one. And this is what I you know kind of brands should be listen to this and thinking about what is the effect because unless we can actually affect the system, we think about normally, you know, things in isolation and really to solve climate change, we owe to think in a systemic way. So well done. Um, it's really a, a, a pleasure and an honor to be working with you. And I mean, Matt, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about biotech and, and how, for example, using biotech, we actually solve some of the big environmental challenges, especially when it comes to biodiversity. So, for example, uh, you know, esqualine, uh, which is, uh, you know, kind of comes from, from sharks. Now you have a way to reproduce this in the lab and you don't have to go and, and, and trying to get a species completely wiped out of the planet. And there's so many examples like this. So can you tell us a little bit more about, I wouldn't say the science, because don't make it too difficult for us, but tell us a little bit more about how this works. Of course. So I think I've heard uh, three important aspects. The first one is traceability. Sabrina was talking about it, and I think this is this is key to make sure that uh, we are sourcing what type of raw material and what could be the, the negative impact we could have on our environment when we do that. So more transparency here is very important, but technology today can address this first issue. The second one is toxicity. I mean, like what we found out is a lot of the ingredients, you know, in, in, in beauty, in personal care are being manufactured for the past 30, 40 years. I mean, like today we have technology to assess if those ingredients are toxic to people, to health of people. OK, and we should address those issues by replacing those ingredients, phasing out those ingredients. And this is exactly what the European Union is doing. Obviously, like we like I would like them to be a bit more, you know, like a bit a bit quicker in the decision, but they are taking the lead, which is great. And the third party is sustainability. Obviously, like is what type of impact the ingredients we are using in our everyday product can have on, on, on the environment. I mean, uh, for example, on our side, we're using plant-based uh, material. We are using the waste of uh, agriculture, uh, the agriculture waste. So basically, we are part of the circular economy, trying to basically create value from a, a, a waste and in order to bring solution to this market. So technology, obviously, those days and, and the, the biochem industry, because the biochem, uh, we, we're part of the green, uh, green chemistry, which is like the biochem technology are really bringing solution to this industry. Obviously, like the um, education of the, of the consumer, giving, being more transparent, trying to, to communicate more around those issues is very important because if we give the opportunity to the consumer to understand better what is in the product, they will be able to, have, to make a better choice. And making a better choice be, is also like putting more pressure on the big brand and the big you know, industrial company. So this is another aspect. But what I'm important to say is like if I remember at the time, I mean like solar energy. I mean, solar energy at the beginning, everybody was saying, oh, my God, this is more expensive. Um, this will not be uh, will not be able to, to scale up that. And today, reality is like solar energy is cheaper to produce than, than oil. So this is exactly what is happening in, in, in a personal care, in a beauty industry. We are having like a transition where ingredients maybe on the short term are slightly maybe more expensive than the, the oil, the oil product. But the reality on the long term, I mean, the industry will, will transform and you will have this plant-based ingredient which will be replacing all these oil-based ingredients because I mean they will be uh, it will be easier to uh, to address traceability it will be no toxic and it will be much more sustainable and people will want to go in that direction so we have seen in other industries such as like blockbusters we have seen the blackberry we have seen kodak you know big giant disappearing because they were not adapting quick enough and this will be happening also in a personal care and in the beauty industry. If you're not able to address this transition and to be part of the future, then you will remain in the past. Um, absolutely. And the challenger brands are the one coming up with fresh ideas, fire and innovation, which is, you know, kind of why is there disrupting the, the, the industry and what is much needed. So, I mean, I'd like to ask you a follow up question uh, before going on to Ria, which is what do you think the future holds for the beauty industry? 
And then I'd like to ask this question for everybody, actually. So let's kick off with you, Matt. I mean, this is a, a, a difficult question to answer, but I think um, if we move ahead in a direction of like creating awareness, okay, and uh, um, also like being very much aware of like our decision can have, I mean, how small changes can have a massive impact when we put them all together. I think we can drive the industry toward a, a more greener future. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. You know, we are working on, on big, you know, daily basis with all the big, the big brand without having to, to name them. And what we're trying to do is like to, to partner with them to help them accelerate this transition toward a greener future because this is having like a massive impact on environment. This is having a massive impact on our health. And I think he's working closely with, with, with those large groups and we can achieve that. And also what I welcome very much is like um, the birth of new brands, the birth, the birth of new brands which have this, this freedom, you know, like to bring like innovation, this freedom to challenge the big guys and to also like remind them that they have to also like bring innovation in what they do because if not reality, I mean, today's a year, but in the future, who knows? So I'm very positive and, and I'm very pleased to see them, uh, uh, you know, the people on that call share the same philosophy and the same mindset. Thank you very much. Ria, what about you? What do you think? I mean, I think the future of beauty is, is, <laughs> is a huge question. I think whenever I'm working um, with brands, particularly in that kind of ideation stage, is asking them ultimately, you know, how, why are you so audacious to even want a brand, right? We are in a very saturated market. And I think any brand that now comes in, whether they are, you know, VC backed or they're self-funded, it's, it's why should you exist, right? Because ultimately, I think quite a lot of the time when brands say, you know, we want to be a sustainable brand, it's like, truthfully, the most sustainable option is there wouldn't be a brand, right? The most sustainable option is that you would work with um you know a company like like mats for example and you will just improve what already exists so i think truly the future of of brands and how they're going to play a part is from the get-go to be honest like almost house of breeding was talking from the get-go certain principles and values being at the core rather than them being an afterthought um i work often quite closely with the more kind of heritage older brands on the market who because of the size of the company naturally are much slower they're much less reactive because things have to go through various levels of approvals they're in multiple markets and the reality is that if they don't adapt to the current changes especially you know if we look at you know the spending power of gen z and millennials if if brands don't adapt to the modern consumer thinking and behaviors you know, in five to 10 years, they won't exist. And that is really, that is covering everything from not just their, their NPD, but also their products, how they talk to consumers. You know, per, in, my, um, in, my, in my job and in, in my career, I often see brands really heavily focused purely on the marketing and like the packaging, but there's so much in that. And consumers now are really more concerned and, and aware of every single part of that process. And I think you know, Sabrina touched on it earlier that supply chain in beauty hasn't really been much of a, it hasn't really played much importance for so many people. But if you look at the way that the food industry has changed, we demand to know that for food. You know, we want to know if we're going to, to eat at a certain restaurant, you know, is it, um, you know, farm to table? And I think I almost say in beauty, it's the same thing, right? It's farm to dressing table now. So how do we evolve with consumers that are, having more information at their fingertips at the same time sometimes that information isn't always correct uh, and it can be quite harmful and, and the brands ultimately I think probably now more than ever because of the way that also media and beauty media is going have the most power they've ever had they can own conversations more so than any other time in the past and that is an incredibly powerful position to be in. Thank you very much, and um, absolutely. And this is the power of also uh, of certifications, whether are single issue certifications or or kind of holistic certifications, to be able to guarantee the consumer that the data that they have is correct, instead yeah. of jumping on bandwagons and things. That if you actually go into that, so avocados, let's theme of that if of course great for your diet fantastic for your skin but the cartels that are happening for the you know over farming of avocados specifically in mexico is the social impact of that are quite devastating mm -hmm. so everything has to be in a 
in a kind of beauty, uh, a beautiful harmony. And I'd like to close with you, uh, Sabrina. So I'd like to ask you the same question. What do you think um, the future of the, uh, of the beauty industry uh, holds? Um, I think for me, probably as a sort of virgin founder here, just getting into my first uh, round in the beauty industry, I could probably speak better to what I hope for the beauty industry um, to be. I mean, I, I hope that people start to realize how strong purchase power is. I do think as much as Ria is completely right about, you know, we don't need any more brands in the same way we don't need any more plastic being produced. I do think consumers have the ability to shift older legacy brands out of the conversation with their purchasing power as long as they understand how important that is um i really hope to see more uh you know black ownership and brands that cater to skin that's melanated and and issues that affect skin that's melanated without it being a bargain bin product or being in a really expensive niche product in a in a beauty line um and i also hope to see just sort of people getting involved in the conversation. And when you spoke about the impacts on society or societal impacts, Diana, I think that resonates with me so strongly because it's so easy to compartmentalize beauty from society. Um, and once we see that those things, you know, it's not a binary conversation that I think people will really start to wake up and, and realize how powerful they are. Thank you very much. And I hope that you being here today and actually hopefully in the next couple of weeks, maybe a month, everybody start looking at the incredible work that you and Idris are, are doing and, and, the, and the launch of the brand and stuff really inspire uh, women, black, uh, sorry, black men or women to actually go into entrepreneurship and see that it's possible to do so. So, um, yeah, I mean, you are, both of you are great inspiration. Um and I'd like to get uh, now to the Q&As uh, from the floor. Um, there is a question for probably each one of you, and if you can keep your answers short. Um, can the beauty industry be a vortex for environmental and health regeneration? Who would like to take this first? Matthew, I feel like this is a great question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, definitely, I was saying that at the beginning, I think the beauty and the personal care industry is, uh, is having a direct impact on, on people and uh, by the fact that people are becoming more and more aware of, uh, um, of what's in our, in our product, they have the, the power to drive change and the power of drive changing is not only like in the beauty and personal care, as I was saying, I mean, behind those brands, you have ingredients which are part of the formulation and those ingredients are made by like huge company, huge company which are like the chemical company of this world and they are the ones who also need to be inspired. They are the ones who also need to hear us. Then we want safer and more sustainable product and ingredients because at the end is having an impact directly on our health, is having an impact directly on on uh, on uh, environment. And so definitely, I believe like beauty and personal care. I mean, is having an important role to play in driving change. Sabrina, was it okay? <laughs> <laughs> great thank you and then um why do you believe people are increasingly searching for companies that foster a feeling of community nowadays sabrina this have to be a question for you i mean i really do think the pandemic had a part to play in that i think we realized you know a lot of people were very lonely and i, I get so sad saying that because i think when we we've all experienced lonely and loneliness and know how sad that can be but I also think that we saw, for instance, with the world's response to the pandemic, that we have to work together. We have to work as a community. If anyone is left behind, it means that we're all in deep water. So I really do think that that definitely has inspired this kind of new energy, especially, I mean, in for us, in us it, to, to think about community and partnership in a different way. Um, but I hope that it continues to resonate this way because, you know, it's really easy to go back onto social or whatever and isolate yourself again and be at home on your computer, not talking to anyone. Um, and I try very hard adamantly as part of my well-being ritual to, to make sure that I include the people in my life and include the partnerships around me and also try to affect change and affect good in, in the work you do, or even just smiling at someone across the street. And it can get very hippy dippy and cheesy very quickly. But I do think simple things like that matter. Just being conscious of someone else's mind state um, really matters. 
Thank you very much. Uh, very inspiring. And um, a question for you, Ria. Um, coming back to the question about importance of building brand communities, which example of successful brand communities that are uh, doing it right can you share with us? Oh, that is a difficult question because I think that there have been brands that have done it from the get-go. So I think Glossier often come to mind um, as a brand that really took ownership of the word community. And again, it's because community is a bit like authenticity on social media. They're kind of labels that get bandied around, uh, sometimes with not much kind of context. And, you know, Glossier, for example, at the time, this was maybe 2016, 2017, obviously, it, you know, it, it was birthed out of a blog and that blog had one of the most engaging comment sections of all time from that i know that they then set up a slack channel so advocates of the brand could discuss together in a slack channel um and that also then involved them you know in the npd process so if when they were working on the brands and the products it was you know do you guys like this what what's your feedback what would you change I think in terms of now, brands that are really doing it, um, there's actually a British brand owned by a kind of fashion stylist Trini Woodall, which is called Trini London. I'm, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. You know, she is absolutely huge in the UK and globally. And she has um, almost like little groups called Trini Tribes. So they meet up. So the, these are people that are dotted all over the world in, in sometimes even the most kind of far reaching pockets of the world and women will meet up and they will get together. And I think that's obviously quite an extreme version. I'm sure that there aren't going to be, you know, groups of, of L'Oreal lovers kind of meeting up, but it's that idea of community really extends far more than just an Instagram page to a follower. You know, is it a podcast? Is it a YouTube? I think even when I think about when brands are doing press events, I'm always saying to my clients, you know, you know, doing a great event for press is fantastic, but that that journalist is never, ever going to buy your product because she's on the PR list. She will get sent it. So now we're seeing a real move again, especially now post pandemic when we can go back outside is having, you know, in real life consumer facing brand activations. Get your 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 customers, your future customers involved right from the get go, because then they feel involved in the party. And I always say that ultimately having a great brand is like having a party, you know, yes, there might be a certain dress list, uh, you know, or, or a certain certain music style, but you want people to feel welcome. So the more that you can bring people into your party, which is, is very challenging if you're D to C or you're only stocked on online retailers, having that in real life experience truly is one of the best ways that you can build upon community time and time again. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question from Oli uh, that says, what part do certification bodies play in holding brands to account for their social and environmental output? And I mean, this is a question uh, for you, Sabrina, because you've just been uh, through the Butterfly Mark certification, which is short of an MI6 investigation. <laughs> uh, so you can talk a lot about that. <laughs> Yeah, that is very true. Um, you know, I think uh, authentic or uh, um, accountability. You said the word it, is so important because if we're not holding people accountable, then what the hell are we doing, right? Um, I also think like the point is so inspiring to me because I think if you're going to foster this community and and engage a community, that comes with responsibility. Um, and and I think it's also the responsibility of the consumers to look to. Uh, us to develop organizations like this, like Positive Luxury, to, to make sure that there's a measure. Um, if there's no measure, how do we know we're doing anything right? I think even for the brands, we came to Positive Luxury making sure that we were doing things right because nobody talks about it. Community also needs to be within brands as well. Brands need to talk to other brands and mentor other brands and mentor newer founders. Um, I've had, a, I've been really fortunate to talk to, you know, people like Charlotte Tilbury, who has been so influential in my life and a great friend to be like so what do you do when this is like this and i mean all this stuff is so important if we're not measuring if we're not holding each other accountable if we're not acting like we're a community i just think what's the point Thank you very much, uh, Sabrina. And before, I mean, I can't believe that the time has gone like this, but um, I like one last thought from each one of you. So if you can give everybody in the audience 
a piece of advice, uh, whether it is to start a business, whether it is to, um, you know, think about entrepreneurship, to think about uh, beauty brands, um, or think about ingredients. What piece of advice would you give to the audience? Let's start with you, Matthew. All right. Maybe uh, if you want a little secret. Um, from my side, I mean, like, yeah, I feel like obviously the industry is not transitioning quick enough. Okay, so so far, I mean, my little secret when my, I buy my my personal care ingredient, whether it is like a shampoo or like sunscreen, I use like baby brand because I have this mindset thinking like, okay, for baby, it must be like a, a stronger regulation. So for the shampoo or cream or anything I buy, I buy baby brands. So like that, you know, I expose myself a bit less to all the, the chemicals. So uh, it's this little, uh, little, uh, little secret which I'm sharing with you guys. But I'm very positive. I'm a very positive person. I've been involved, you know, in that industry for, for many years. And I've basically seen the, the pre-COVID and the post-COVID. I think people are realizing that being healthy is extremely important because, I mean, like this, having a massive impact on you everyday life and and what's important to realize is everything we use in our everyday which is like beauty or personal care having a massive impact on our health i mean like i was reading lately that 80 percent of what you put on your skin is being absorbed i mean like this is incredible so you definitely want to make sure you use the right product and with the right ingredient so on that aspect i really encourage like all the the, the, the people like listening today to to be even more careful in terms of what they buy and to make the right decision because sometimes they uh, underestimate the, the power of decision is is massive once you put all the small decision together mm. it can really drive change so this is what i have to say regarding like um, what i'm doing and, and and my advice for, for everyone thank you well we now know to add that <laughs> into our beauty routine uh thank you matt um ria <laughs> i mean First of all, I want to say that I actually do the same as Matt as well. I, ah, I love um, thank you, like, yeah. products for babies, so you're not alone. <laughs> um, my piece of advice, I mean, I, I said I, I work very closely with a lot of brands and I even did like a course last year for how to launch a beauty brand. And I think my one biggest thing is that very early research phase of when working out your user persona. So many brands now, Lord, are we're for everybody. And actually trying to talk and market your product to everybody is so hard. So really having an idea of who your user personas are and thinking not just of your demographics, but also your psychographics. Where are they shopping now? What else are they purchasing? Where are they hanging out? Where do they hang out? Not only in real life, but also what kind of websites, what social media do they use? That body of work, you would be surprised how many brands, and I've, I've had clients that are like multi-million pound revenue clients that are like, oh yeah, we're for this person. And we're like, but you're not. And then when we actually kind of target them more directly, sales lift, the engagement rises. So I would, I'd always say that it's not maybe the, the funnest or the sexiest piece of work, but understanding who your product is for, particularly when we're seeing lots of trends now where brands are really kind of slightly more targeted and those niche is very, it's a really useful body of work to do. Thank you very much. And what about you, Sabrina? I think I would just uh, say maybe challenge everything and question everything. Um, I think it's really easy to get complacent with branding and marketing. And, um, you know, I find myself even wanting people to challenge me now. And it, I, it, it's the most refreshing thing. And not in a way that doesn't discourage conversation, but in a way that encourages conversation and helps educate. Um because I think we're we're losing very quickly forums to discuss and, and and engage with other people on what they think is right or wrong without it being sort of like you know a, I hate the words but like cancel culture type thing. I think everyone can learn and like Rio pointed out, there's still brands that still you know that are doing really well and might look like from the outside they know what they're doing, but there's still lots of room to grow. So challenge everything. Thank you very much. And what I love about this panel is your levels of honesty and no filter. So thank you so much for that. Transparency has been the theme. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for taking the time uh, to speaking with us today. And uh, I'd like to hand over the floor to Jamie. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, I'd also like to um, echo a thanks to Matthew 
Ria and Sabrina, thank you all so much for giving us your valuable time, your, your experience and your brilliant insights. Uh, this webinar will be released again to watch again on our website in the coming days. Please do visit positiveluxury.com to download our new beauty and fragrance report. Sign up to our newsletter, follow Positive Luxury on LinkedIn for news about our next reports, our webinars, and get involved with the community. Also, don't hesitate to get in touch with us here at Positive Luxury to discuss how our experts and sustainability certification can help your business. Um, so once again, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone's questions. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.